Now, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, you're going to see really a new platform that's launched and you'll see why this is the, the crowning jewel, I believe, that helps truly and helps you understand that we make wealth real here. But let's talk about the lead, our lead uh, uh, expert for Trust My Assets. Let's bring up Mr. Roger Grant. Hey, Andama, how you doing, brother? Doing outstanding, Roger. I had to, I had to tell him that you're out there. You're in the business too, and and you saw that what you saw with MWR. So what you said, I like something you said at the event. Something you said to me. You said, "Now this is my family. MWR is a part of my family." So this information that you're going to kind of share with us, and they'll understand very clearly why this is generally just passed on through bloodlines. But now we are all a part of your bloodline. Is that correct? Is that how we get that information, Roger? Absolutely, brother. True financial information in this country is not taught. It's passed down and it's generally passed down within a bloodline. And that's where it stays. Right. Um, this weekend or a couple of weekends ago in, in Florida, I got attached to a new bloodline. My bloodline just grew. So <laughs> my mentor poured into me some things that none of us were ever meant to know. And and now it's my job to disseminate that that to the rest of the family. All right. Well, outstanding. Well, I'm going to get out of your way and I'm going to let you do just that because I think people are absolutely in for some eye opening uh, an eye opening experience tonight. So, uh, Roger, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you, Dom. Well, guys, look there. If you don't take anything else away from what I'm going to say tonight, I want you to understand that there are two sets of financial information in this country, two sets. And if you make a certain amount of money, you're privy to one set of information doesn't ne necessarily mean that you're going to get it, but you have a shot at getting it and everything else is offered to the public. Right. So what I want you guys to understand about trust is this. It's how many of you when you think about a trust, you think about millionaires and billionaires and trust fund babies. Right. That's what we think about is normal people are like, what do I need a trust for? I don't have that kind of money. Well, it's not about millionaires and billionaires and trust fund babies. And the person who has very little to lose, you have some things that you've acquired. You can't afford to lose those things. And what a trust does is protect your assets. It controls your assets so that you don't have the liabilities of ownership, right? So it's a guy with a, a home that has $50,000 worth of equity that he wants to protect that needs a trust. It is... Uh, the person with, you know, maybe a substantial amount of cash in the bank, 30, 40, $50,000 in the bank that you want to protect. And here's why that millionaire billionaire, if he loses everything, he's got the contacts and the resources to rebuild it and get it back. The guy who just has his home or just has a bank account with a little bit of money in it can't afford to go get into a car accident and have all of that at risk over some something that happened in an instant that, that was a complete accident. So it's not about just the elite protecting assets. The person who has a little bit that they spent building needs to put in more effort in protecting what you spent your life building. All right. So let me, let me give you a little background on me. I'm not going to give a deep background like I gave at the convention, but I was in the mortgage business for about a decade. Right. And in the mortgage business, I managed to, start making money in my second year and, and the IRS hit me over the head for about $50,000 in taxes, right? Um, my CPA told me what I needed to do to, to keep their IRS from treating me like that, right? I ended up buying a $650,000 house. I didn't have any kids at the time, right? I ended up getting into an insurance policy that was $1,200 and I ended up buying a, a, a Cadillac Escalade that was about eleven or $1,200 a month in payment. And I already had a Cadillac Escalade. I did not need a second Cadillac Escalade. I didn't need a five bedroom house. I didn't need this monster insurance policy. I didn't need those things. What I needed was to keep the IRS from abusing me and taking what I was building, right? So I did all of those things, right? And then I ended up in a custody battle for my daughter right in the middle of all of this. And that cost me a ton of money. So long story short, I fought through all of this, right? got everything paid off, got full custody of my daughter. And about three months later, the mortgage meltdown happened and I had nothing left to survive it because I followed 
that other set, the two sets of information, right? And my CPA was no slouch. When I met him, he had just built a $10 million house in the Silicon Valley. He was no slouch. And he gave me the best information that he had, but it wasn't the best information there was, right? So what I want to do is we're going to jump into a, a, a little slideshow presentation. And then uh, we're going to have a conversation about trust just because I want you guys to become familiar with this conversation because it's for everyday people. It's not for the elite alone, I should say. So what are we doing here, folks? We're here literally trying to separate ourselves from the masses. That is what MWR Financial does. It takes you from being that person who's allowing the IRS to take too much money out of your check every month to recouping that money, right? To, to having a good credit score, to living a debt-free life. These are the things that the masses don't do. And so we're, we're already in a place of separating yourself from the masses. So when it comes to this conversation of trust and protecting assets and taxes and things like that, we're going to separate ourselves even further from the masses, right? That's the goal is to not be them. And here's why. For you Bible believers out there, this is one of my favorite passages of scripture, the narrow and the wide gate. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who will enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who will find it. What that passage of scripture right there is telling me is if the masses are doing it, it's probably wrong. But at bare minimum, we need to, we need to think twice about what the masses are doing. What the Bible is telling us, not just spiritually, but in every walk of life, and I'm going to show you this financially, if it's being taught to the masses, we need to be critical thinkers of that type of information. Because they're, they're, there's two sets of information, right? And if this narrow passage is set up for them, what are they doing for the rest of these people to cause them to walk through that wide gate? Now, I'm going to put this and I'm going to use an example of the 401k and your private reserve account for those who've been with the uh, MWR Financial for any amount of time. We are all taught to get into a 401k or an IRA. Your money's not taxed. It grows tax deferred, and then you pay taxes sometime later, right? Well, let's examine that for a minute. Is the dollar going to be stronger today or sometime in the future? If you're my age, you remember when candy bars cost you a quarter. Now they're like a buck 50. So your dollars are always going to be stronger today than they are in the future. So why are we giving up strong dollars today for what we know will be weaker dollars in the future? And then let's talk about taxes. They say you pay the taxes sometime later. OK, somebody tell me what the tax rate is going to be in 30 or 40 years. Unless you have a crystal ball, you can't answer that question. But here's what we do know that is a fact. The IRS has been in existence since 1913. The tax rate environment that we are in right now is the third lowest tax rate environment in the history of the IRS. And what we have people doing right now is giving up a known quantity for an unknown quantity and calling that preparing for your future, preparing your retirement. That's not preparing, that's gambling. But this is what the masses have been taught, which is why MWR is teaching you about the private reserve account and the diversified cash flow account that allow you to live a tax-free retirement. This is what MWR is teaching, and here's why they're teaching it. This is why the company is teaching that. It's because true financial in this, uh, information in this country is not taught, it's passed down. And to show you that, I want to talk a little bit about our HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. And in the black community, they are beloved, right? But I'm going to show you how information goes right over our head. And we just don't know the things we don't know, right? John Rockefeller started the United States Board of Education in 1903. And Congress let him do that. And then they had to come back in 1913 and do an investigation into what they let this brother get away with doing because he controlled the whole educational system. 
here are the two things that, that uh, Rockefeller knew, Rockefeller and Carnegie, I should say. They knew that if they could control the entities that put out information, and if they can co control the curriculum of those entities, then they can control behaviors. They can be control outcomes, which means they can control a whole country. I want you to hear three things that, that Rockefeller said. You can look these up. These are Rockefeller quotes. The guy who started the United States Board of Education said these three things. Competition is a sin. Number one, I don't want a nation full of thinkers. I want a nation full of workers. Competition is a sin. I don't want a nation full of thinkers. I want a, a nation full of workers. And he started the educational system with that in mind. So when we talk about information, for example, the Dewey Decimal System, if you think about it, every developed nation in the, in the world learns the metric system for math. What you're going to see when you look at the presentations on MWR, I lost my slideshow there. There we go. Um, what you're going to see when you see the pre presentation um, on the NWR uh, website that I put together for you guys is uh, Dewey and Rockefeller were very close friends. And Rockefeller funded Dewey teaching the Dewey Decimal System, which is why we learn that, which is he's controlling that from the grave today. Every other nation learns a metric system. Now, in terms of institutions that put out information, our HBCUs, um, most people don't know that Morehouse was pastor, uh, uh, Rockefeller's pastor and his business partner. And Spellman was his wife's maiden name. These are two of our most beloved <laughs> of HBCUs, but we don't understand where they came from. Remember the mindset of the person who started these institutions. I don't want people competing with my businesses. I don't want a nation full of thinkers. I want a nation full of workers. I don't want them thinking. I don't want them competing with me. If they're thinking, they're competing with me. I want them working for my businesses and patronizing my businesses, not competing with me and thinking like me. That's how he started the school system. So this morning I was uh, watching ESPN as I was getting ready to go to a doctor's appointment. And it's, it's Black History Month. And... I heard him say something about Spelman College, and I recorded this little clip on my phone that I'm going to share with you guys in a minute. But I, you may not be able to see or hear it as clearly, so I want to caption it so hopefully you can grasp this. It was talking about Spelman College, had a, a young lady talking about why she went to an HBCU, right? And I want you to see if you can catch behind her the name on the building behind her where she's standing. If we can play that clip real quick. They tell us everything we need to know in plain sight. Spelman College, the maiden name of Rockefeller's wife, Laura Spelman Rockefeller. And this young lady is talking about HBCUs and her blackness in front of Rockefeller Hall. I mean, come on, y'all. We just got to pay attention. So, folks, here's what I'm going to tell you. There's two sets of information, but they give us breadcrumbs everywhere you look. There's information provided to you. Right there, they're telling you, why would John D. Rockefeller's name be on the Spelman University? It's because he started the university. But the goal is, as we separate ourselves from the masses and we try to win this money game, we have to be critical thinkers of information and process what makes more sense. And that's what MWR is providing to the public because they're not going to teach it in mass. So guys, here's what the deal is. It's not about how much money you, you earn or how much money you save. It's about how much money you keep and spend generationally. What I want y'all to really focus on is when we're talking about a trust, we're talking about establishing generational wealth. 
we can make wealth real today, but can we get it to the next generation and the one after that? Because the Bible says a, a, a wise man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. How do we pull that off? Because most of us end up in probate or legal situations that, that prevent the next generation from inheriting what we spend our life building. Without a trust, it's very difficult to establish any kind of a generational legacy plan. So let's talk about the IRS real quick. The IRS was created in 1913, as I told you guys a little while ago. The other thing that happened in 1913 was the Federal Reserve Bank, which nothing federal about the Federal Reserve, was created in 1913. So once they got their bank in place, then they put their collection agency in place. The IRS is not an informational organization. It's not their job to educate you on how to prevent them from collecting because that's what they do. They're a collection company, right? So once they got their collection company in place, these are the laws they passed from 1913 to 1916. They passed four laws. The income tax law. No, there was not an income tax law in America before 1913. They passed the probate tax law. Almost all of us know somebody whose family has been caught up in probate and, and their assets eaten away by the court system because they didn't have a succession plan, a legacy plan. They passed the inheritance tax and they passed the estate tax. Now, the other thing that happened in 1913, aside from these laws that they passed, was they created two tax forms in the beginning, two, a 1040 tax form and a 1041 tax form. 1040 is one that we all know because we've all filed it. Most have never heard of a 1041, and even if you've heard of it, you've not filed that tax form. What they created was a tax form for the informed family and one for everybody else, two sets of financial information, right? Narrow path, broad path. Everybody knows the 1040. Nobody knows the 1041. But here's the point in all of that. The IRS, when you, when you do things the way they're telling us to do it, kind of like the 401ks and the IRS, here's what happens. Your money becomes theirs. Yes, I said theirs. In the proper context, not over there, not they are possession. So we have to be critical thinkers of the information we take in because you want to keep your money. You don't want it to be their money, right? Let's look at the 401ks. If, if you want to touch your 401k and somebody's popping your hand and charging you 10%, that ain't your money. It's theirs, right? So let's move forward. The elite understand taxes, right? Here's what they really understand. There's two things that the elite really understand. One, they understand which tax form to file and which one not to and they know how not to be liable for the taxes in the first place. That's it, nothing real deep. If you can accomplish those two things, you can put yourself in a whole lot better tax position. So we've been talking about information, we've been talking about assets, we've been talking about taxes. I'm gonna give you some information about taxes that I'm sure most of you never knew. This is Flora versus the United States, United States Supreme Court. It says the income tax system is based upon voluntary compliance, not this strain. I'm going to say that again. The income tax system is based upon voluntary compliance, not this strain, which means you had to opt in and they can't force you to opt in. But nobody ever knew that they were opting in. And most of us don't even know when we opted in. And I'm going to tell you now. When you got your first job and you filled out a W-4 and you agreed for them to take taxes out of your check, you just volunteered. And you can't unvolunteer. You're not getting off the IRS tax rolls once you volunteer to be on them, right? So it's voluntary. It's not by the strength. What else does the court have to say? The word income is not defined in the Internal Revenue Code, U.S. Supreme Court, U.S. versus Ballard. The word income is not defined in the code. Y'all, what do we pay taxes on? How are you going to tax me on something you cannot define in your own tax code? But it gets worse. IRC 26, Internal Revenue Code, Section 26, Title 6201, only provides authority for the secretary to assess the tax, not the income. So hold on. We pay taxes on the income. The IRS is assessing the tax but they cannot assess, in their own handbook, they cannot assess the income, which they cannot even define, but they have us volunteering into a system where they can't define it and they can't assess it. 
Right. That part. The information that we receive, y'all, we have to be critical thinkers and we got to dive deeper than what they're giving us because they're not going to give us that narrow path. They're going to lead us onto that broad path that ends up in destruction. And that's what happens to us financially. I'm going to read this to you. This is a court case um, from the, uh, I think it's 1997 in, in Denver, Colorado, the 12th, the 10th Circuit Court, in Denver, Colorado. Out of that court case came this discovery from the Handbook for Special Agents for the IRS. It says avoidance of taxes is not a criminal offense. I'm going to say that again. Avoidance of taxes is not a criminal offense. You know what is a criminal offense? Evading taxes. Evading and avoidance is not the same thing. When you volunteer for that system and then you just decide I'm not going to do it anymore, now you're evading. But their handbook says avoiding of taxes is not a criminal offense. Any attempt to reduce, avoid, minimize, or alleviate taxes by legitimate means is permissible. Let's break that down. Reduce, avoid, minimize, or alleviate, right? When the next words say by legitimate means, means there's a way to legitimately reduce, avoid, minimize, or that last word. What does word alleviate mean? There's a legitimate way to alleviate taxes. How many people ever told you that? Why are we walking around scared of these people? Their own handbook is telling them that they can't assess the income. And avoiding tax is not illegal. We just got to understand the language and the systems that are in place with those two tax forms that we told you about in the beginning. There's a system that they created to help them avoid the laws that they were passing. Here's what Rockefeller said. This is uh, uh, Nelson Rockefeller, the, the grandson of John D. Rockefeller, the one whose name was on Spellman's building, right? And Nelson Rockefeller was also the former vice president of the United States of America. And here's what he said. He said, the key to success is to own nothing but control everything. If you listen to Robert Kiyosaki, Kiyosaki says the difference between rich people and poor people is poor people want to own things. Rich people don't want to own anything. But what are they actually saying? How do you pull this off? So I'm going to explain that to you real quick. Then I'm going to give you a quick overview of how we deal with the tax situation. And then we're going to jump into a conversation. So the key to success is to own nothing but control everything. The only way you can have full control over assets with none of the liabilities of ownership is to be a trustee in a true trust contract, an irrevocable complex trust contract. If you are the trustee, you control those assets, but you have no ownership liability. And that's exactly what Rockefeller is talking about. But he's dropping breadcrumbs. Like I said, they give us information everywhere. We just got to understand the language. My job is to decipher that information, to, to make the language more clear. So let me show you how that information right there can deal with the tax issue. I'm going to give you an overview of what we do for a business. Let's say we have a profitable business, a single member LLC, just one owner. And the business is pretty profitable. They're doing $500,000 a year. They have 300 expenses. 200 is left over as profit, taxable liability. The owner of that company is going to give himself a K-1 and he's going to pay personal income tax on that $200,000. He's going to try to write that down with the mortgage and some other incidentals. Going to pay 40, 50, 60 grand in taxes. No way around that, right? So what we do with that business is we have the owner add another member to that LLC as a member, as an owner. And that would be a business trust. And here's why we do what we do. The trust can do two things that no company and no person can do. It can either pass on taxable liability to a beneficiary or it can give 100% of its income to charity. That's it. Those two things. It's not real hard. So here's what it looks like. 200000 in profits. Now the owner sends that on a K-1 to the business trust. The business trust takes that two hundred in as income. And now the business trust doesn't want to pay taxes on it. So it distributes that out to the beneficiary, which is a family trust. Now your business just zeroed out. 500 in income, 300 in expenses, 200 passed on the K-1 to the trust. 
pass to the beneficiary. That leaves zero. You can't get taxes out of zero. Now, the family trust takes in this $200,000 as income. And the family trust has all of its lawful deductions. It may have a mortgage, a couple rental properties. Uh, even putting kids through college can be an expense for the trust. Let's just say the family trust has $100,000 in expenses throughout the course of the year. That still leaves $100,000 of taxable income, right? Well, the family trust can either pay the taxes on that or the last step in the series of interrelated trusts is a private family foundation. Now, the, found that the trust that 100% tax deductible charitable gift to your own private family is zeroed out. It had 200 in income, 100 in expenses. That last 100 was a 100% tax deductible charitable gift. That leaves zero. There's nothing left to tax. Now, that last $100,000 inside of a, is inside of a tax exempt entity that can invest in anything that is legal and lawful and grow money tax free legally. And all you have to do, you have one major obligation from the foundation that is you must give away 5% of what comes in to charitable activities. That could be your church, it could be the Boys and Girls Club, the March of Dimes, a hospital, a university, doesn't matter where you send it. This is how you take a half a million dollars, let go of 5K, and it really didn't go to the IRS, it went somewhere you wanted it to go, something that you're passionate about. You can only do that by controlling things. And the reason Rockefeller said what he said is there's liabilities to ownership. Anything you own can be taxed to you and taken from you. We just got to understand the language and the systems that they put in place because you do not have to be a millionaire or billionaire to do what they do. With that, Dom, let's let's talk about it a little bit. I'm so excited. I'm just literally seeing so many of the comments. People are blown away. I knew they would be. One of the things that, that's so valuable about what you just said was just understanding that that there are two sets of 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 way of information in this country and we're never met. It was all set up for none of us to ever understand how the other how the other half live. So as you said, we want to separate ourselves from the masses. This allows you to do it. One of the things that attracted you so much to being able to offer this to MWR in a way that you had never planned to do before was because you saw that we were trying to separate from the masses with the, all the services that we do. And you saw this absolutely just dovetailed together, especially when you talk about the, the platform that we just ad added last week, which was Diversified Cash Flow Account. Right. So so with that being said, let's talk about something, because I know if, if someone wants to just protect their assets, well, let, no, let's go. But let's go in reverse to structure your legacy completely, because that is the ultimate goal for everyone. Uh -oh. OK, you can hear me. You froze up for a minute. You got okay. OK. All right. So that's everyone's goal is to structure their their legacy, as we call it. So therefore, they can legally do exactly what you just said to do legally and ethically eliminate their personal tax liability so they have none and then their entities have none and they're able to give money to what what they're passionate about helping and giving that to that let me, being said, let me clarify something in sure. terms of language right we're yes. not eliminating personal tax liability directly what we're doing is you're shifting that liability so you don't have the liability I love it. Just keep the language. There you go. That's why I'm not the expert, Roger. That's why they're going to be talking to you and not me. <laughs> yeah, so we're not going to evade taxes. Right. No, we're not going to do that at all. Them. Right. Okay. Well, that being said, okay, so shifting that liability and doing that, Roger, like I said, you, you, it's been a, you normally charge a minimum of $25,000. Let's just say that's the floor, but it can go into well into the six figures based on someone's situation. But you did something that was, to me, really, really profound. And, and I have to thank also our CEO and founder, Mr. Brian House, because he, he was a part of at making this happen. But uh, you, you said for MWR, which is the only company you will ever ex do this for. So we, it, we have an exclusive uh, environment with you. Is that correct? 100%. Here, tell us what what's going to happen if we want to go through structure my my uh, 
uh, my structure, my assets or structure, my legacy. That's what that path is called. Cause there's two paths for everyone. Just so you know, under trust my assets, there's going to be two paths you can take. You can structure your complete legacy. And what would that uh, call? Co- what would that cost be now, Roger? Half 12, five. 12, so five for all three structures, 12, five. Elim- eliminating taxes permanently. Did everybody hear that? Now, let me say this, Dom. Yes. Um, that is for fully structuring your business, which will protect assets and and, and give you the ability to, to, to avoid taxes, right? Right. Um, now, to protect my assets for those that just, just have access real, to protect. Okay. Real, real quick. That's not something that has to be done all at once, mm-hmm. right? You were just about to speak about protecting assets. Anybody that has something to protect, you need to have a trust, a bare minimum family trust, right? As you build your your income, you can put the other pieces together over time. Um, so, you know, it's not something that 12-5 doesn't have to be done in one day. Right. No, and I love that. I love that you're, you're allowing for that as well. So the other pathway that people can take and, and that can start the process is protect my assets. And like you said, if they have anything that they're trying to protect, if they have a home, if they have a collectibles, if they have, uh, you know, whatever assets they have and they want to protect those, what is the cost to do that? $2,500. $2,500. Now, you know, what, Roger, in fact, here's, I want to do this now, Roger, so we can have a real discussion. I'm going to bring on a gentleman that, uh, <laughs> he, he, I'm, and I'm just going to bring them on quickly because I, I know I want to look at our time and I want to make sure we get some questions asked. I'm going to bring on our,
my number one income earner, someone who absolutely I know is locked in because we had to do a little a little kind of a pilot program. And so he was willing to be that be that test dummy, if you will, but knew it wasn't a test at all. But uh, Mr. Brian N. Bean, can you join us, my friend? What's up, man? Can you hear me okay? We can hear you well. Roger, good to see you again. What's going on, Brian? Hey, we've been talking every day, man. We've been talking every day. And uh, <laughs> I just want to let everybody know it's a very simple process, Dom. You asked me, it's a, yeah. it's a very simple process, man. He's, um, he, he the, the PowerPoint slides does his knowledge no justice. When y'all get to Roger personally or his team and you fill out the simple forms, the simple questions they ask, it's like taking candy from a baby. Right. No, it really is. It, the simplicity of what the system is, it, is powerful. So let's do this. You know what, Roger? Let's say I had a trust because I'll tell you, I've had a trust, but I know typically I was paying four or five thousand dollars just to get a trust. But some people out there say, well, yeah, I have a trust. I did that. My my mother and father in love, they have a trust. And right now my my wife is going through some things. And now with the knowledge that she has now versus what my father in love did, she's seeing all the holes. Why don't you explain to us the difference between someone that has a, a regular trust? Mm -hmm. And in regular trust, they're in, in a different jurisdiction than this. Explain yeah. the difference so people understand that. Okay, so attorneys on average will range anywhere from $3,500 to, to as much as $7,500 for one trust, right? What they're going to put together for you is going to be something completely different than what we're going to put together for you. What they're going to put together is nine times out of 10, a revocable trust, or most of you have probably heard the term, a living trust. That's a common term, right? Here's the definition of a trust. The trust is a three-party contract in which one can create a binding inviolate entity. A three-party contract in which one can create a binding inviolate entity. Here's how a living trust or a grantor trust, they're the same thing. They're synonymous. Here's how those are usually set up. They will have the, the, the person who wants to set up the trust be the creator, they will also have that person be the trustee, and then they pick a loved one, a child or somebody to be the beneficiary, right? Well, that violates the definition of a trust. A trust is a three-party contract. When you do it that way, and if you have a living trust right now, go look at it, and I guarantee you this is how it's set up. You're the creator, you're the trustee, and you pick the beneficiary. That's only two parties, three positions, but two parties. So you violate the definition. And so what happens with that is you don't create a true trust contract that creates a separate legal entity. By IRS de definition, it's a separate legal taxable person, right? What you end up creating with that type of trust is you create an alter ego. That's not a trust contract. It's a trust agreement. And there's no asset protection inside of a, a revocable trust, a grantor trust. You still own that stuff. So you put your stuff, all your assets into a trust, something unfortunate happens, you get in a car wreck, somebody gets hurt or perishes, everything you thought you had protected, there's no protection. It's good for probate. It will definitely get you around probate, has no asset protection capabilities. Now, the second thing is they're going to put it in the state jurisdiction. And I'm not going to get too deep into this, but I will tell you this, the law of America, the true law of the land is English common law. And when you take that trust contract and you put it in the proper jurisdiction of law, it becomes bulletproof. We don't deal on statutory. We deal above the state. That's perfect. That is absolutely perfect. Well, I love that. So, uh, 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 Brian, I know that you've now started going through the process. What, what's a question that, that, that you know that you might have had that you know other people have? Just to Yeah, have well, clear yeah, for sure. Un until they actually see the form and the simplicity of the form. Um, you, you won't see how simple it is. My, my main thing was, and it was real simple, the family trust. I mean, the business trust is where your money comes in. The family trust gets the money and disbursement from the business. And the family is you guys and your trustees that you put on. And then the foundation trust is, is our third in line that takes whatever the family trust didn't spend. So that way it's real simple. Business trust, family trust, and foundation trust. And now you have a 501c3 and you're building a legacy and living a legacy and leaving a legacy. And I got this from you, Andamo. All a will does, for example, is guarantee that you will end up in, in probate. So, so okay. you, Brian, I, I say this. I say a will is an express invitation to probate. <laughs> Not express. <laughs> express invitation. Express. First, first class. In a hurry. 
in a hurry. Yeah. So, guys, the hardest thing for me was to define my name. Like, I was like, uh, Roger, what should I call my my business trust? What should I call my family trust? What should I call my foundation? And, and the hardest thing was just the name. So he gave me some ideas based on what he knows about me. But, Roger, what I asked you today, I said, you know, we did all our consultations and I got my paperwork. What about the investments that I've made? What about the money that may be in my savings account? What about um my brokerage firm or my investment account? It just hit me. I'm like, where does that go? So where does the money we have right now? How does the trust protect that money? And that's a great question. So the key is not to own it, but to control it, right? So you got $100,000 in a bank account. You're going to set up your trust and open up your trust bank account. You're going to move that money out of your name. You don't want it in your name. There you go. You still control it in the trust account. You have a stock account, uh, a, a Schwab account, whatever. Right. You just open up another account with Schwab under the name of the trust and you move everything into that. Now it's out of your, there's no more liability. You don't you have go. the liability of ownership, housing, everything. Everything, because I, I don't think people realize, because like you said, we, we keep it in millionaire and billionaire language. They don't realize that the trust is an actual entity that will have an account that you'll have access to, just like if you were a person. You know what I mean? So it, it hit me when you asked that question. Here's how we make this simple for everyday folks, right? If you've ever had any sort of a business entity, a lot of people have LLCs or S Corps, right? Yep. You get your paperwork, you take the paperwork to the bank, and you open up a bank account with $50. Yep. $50 or $100. Once you get your trust documents notarized, I'm going to tell you what to say to the bank to open up. Your, and they're going to open it up with $50 or $100. Yeah. That's all you need. That's it. And, and Brian, just so you know, that's exactly what I did. I literally just went. I had some assets in different places and just took the paperwork. And it was just a paperwork exchange. It's like, quick. it's quick. It's like me. And I know you've done this for your son. When my kids were young and we had a custodial account, and we put the, we put their name on the account, but I had control of it still because yep. they were young. Well, that's all it was. It was just like I, now it all goes there. I don't have to. My name is not on. I literally my name isn't on anything. Yeah, anything so, anymore. So, Roger, <laughs> how will I know? This is like how a lot of people think that I've been talked to. How will I know, Roger, when I need a trust? When am I trust ready? What qualifies me to get Roger's paperwork? Am I ready now? Do I need to wait until I have this? What, Roger, what makes me trustworthy and to see you? That's a good question. So for in terms of protecting assets, you just weigh it out in your mind. What do I have? And is $2,500 worth protecting that? Mm. If I have $5,000 in the bank, $2,500 may not you know, make sense to, right now. I probably don't have $2,500 hanging around, right? So right. that might, but if I got $50,000 in the bank, Protect. Then it starts to make more sense. So anything that you have that you want to protect, ask yourself, is $2,500 worth it to protect this for life? That's the first place. Um, in regards to structuring your income and, and, and eliminating taxes and all of that, because we've reduced the price for MWR, my typical client, it starts to make sense about $100, $150 in profit. Now, because we've reduced the price, I would say a right around $70 thousand in income mm. um, business income if you're a w2 you probably still want to be 100 150 but we can do some damage i can't eliminate taxes or alleviate taxes as a w2 but if you're making 150 we can do some damage with it with the foundation we can knock 30 percent of that out but go. if you have business income through mwr or any other type of business and you're making seventy thousand plus it's time for you to start examining when you want to pull that trigger can you can you give a scenario or maybe two, maybe a, a, a big, a, ma a major and a minor where because somebody had a trust in place, Brian, this is what they were able to do. Or because she didn't. Here's what happened to her. I'll give you an example. Um, Chadwick Bozeman, you know, Black Panther, when he passed away, the wife got some money. The mother got some money. But I want everybody to go research how much the government got out of his estate. You know, mm -hmm. we, heard, we hear about James Brown, Mr. Grant, right, was yeah. was had passed 10 years ago, but probate tied it up and the family couldn't get any of those assets. What about some personal clients of yours? Because in this business, stories are everything. Maybe one or two stories of here's what was able to happen because she had her trust in place or didn't. I thought of one. Um, oh, public figure. 
Okay. OJ, OJ Simpson. Okay. OJ Simpson is still surviving because he had a lot of his assets in trust. There you go. And they couldn't touch it. So that's a public figure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in the 25 years that my mentor, my mentor just passed last year, he, but in his 25 to 30 years before he, before he left here, he only shared with me one client that actually had a lawsuit. But here's what happened. This guy owned a business. One of his employees made a mistake that genuinely cost the customer a ton of money. Dude brought a lawsuit, but because we don't operate at the state level, all we did was he gave him the paperwork to challenge the court's jurisdiction. The court doesn't have jurisdiction over this trust. This is a federal organization. So if there's going to be a lawsuit brought, it has to be brought at the federal level. The attorney for the, for the complainant, the dude who lost the money, most attorneys not equipped to operate. They don't deal at the federal level. So he literally walked away from a legitimate lawsuit because it was in the jurisdiction of law the safest. So that's real. Now, I share with you guys uh, a story from a young lady that I know that um, I'll share this story again. A friend of mine is, is from Beaumont, Texas, where the first oil wells were drilled in the state of Texas. Um, me and her were talking about trust, and I, I, I could see she knew some stuff. Beaumont is old money. It's old oil money. She grew up there, so she knew about trust. She knew about a business trust. She asked me to come down and do a presentation for her realtor. She was a regional man manager for Keller Williams. And so I went down there, did my presentation afterwards. She had this perplexed look on her face. And she said, Roger, do you have to leave right away or, or can you hang out for a little bit? I said, yeah, I'm good. What's going on? She pulled me into her office, closed the door. She says, I want to tell you what happened to me um, when my husband passed away. I said, okay. She said, we had three boys and we set up three trusts for each one of them. They were true, irrevocable trusts. My mother was the trustee on all three trusts, or excuse me, the creator on all three trusts. I was the trustee, the one in control, right? Each boy was the beneficiary on their own trust. Her middle child, when he turned 18, was addicted to drugs. He didn't agree with his mom and he wanted his inheritance right now. Went and got an attorney and found a judge that agreed with this kid and revoked her irrevocable trust. Gave this kid a half a million dollars. He proceeded to bloat every dime in less than 12 months. Here's a mother trying to do right with a level of information. She had a lot of information. She just didn't know to be in the, in the right jurisdiction. Here's the problem, folks. When you're in that state jurisdiction, state judges are the authority for the state. And not always are you going to get an appeal. So if they make a decision. You cannot revoke an irrevocable trust. That's against the law. But a lot of our judges want to legislate from the bench. They don't necessarily follow uh, the Constitution or, or court precedent. And you're not always going to be able to have a remedy for that. She did everything she could to protect her. This, this judge cost his kid his inheritance. So being in the proper jurisdiction of law is critical. That's crazy. So this judge overturned it made it made it revoke uh, irrevocable trust revocable and because he had a, a an addiction he she hurt his future basically the judge ruined what the mother was trying to protect destroyed right. destroyed his inheritance mm. but had she been in the right jurisdiction then they don't because then now they don't just get to have a judge kind of overturn it because the judge has to see a panel of federal judges correct well here's what happens at the federal level and you'll see this um when people go into court in the federal on the federal level, you typically get one judge, but you're guaranteed a, an appeal. Uh, you can appeal to a panel of judges, and it's always at least three, and they hold each other accountable to the law. When you're at the state level, you're not always going to get an appeal, and you're never going to get a panel. Mm. Right? You got one judge making decisions, and sometimes he can make a wrong decision and mess you up thoroughly. Got to come out of that jurisdiction. And on a federal level, if you think for one minute that appellate judges overturn their friends and colleagues' decisions, it it, it, it doesn't happen, guys. I've seen it, unfortunately, in some you know some street issues I, of people I know. Appellate judges don't go, yeah, just so and so was wrong. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. <laughs> it doesn't so, happen. so essentially, um, and Brian, why don't you do this because we're we're getting close to the end here. Uh, first of all, Roger, the information just incredible. I'm seeing all oh. the. the 
the, everyone's just like blown away. They, they love the education that they're getting, what the experts are doing. They understand. I think they're getting a sense that, wait a minute, for the first time, and Brian, I think you can address this too, people really feel like, wait a minute, I can truly make wealth real now. I can truly not only live the legacy as MWR is teaching us, but I can leave a legacy for real, for real. Yeah. So that, that that's exciting. But Brian, why don't you share with them how? Because one of the things that I knew that not everybody can scratch a check for 2,500, let alone 12,500. But we have something that creates business income. And we have the ability to put this all together and attract people that we never could attract before. We can now bring them here to MWR because they will be able to be in a position to take advantage of this new platform. So Brian, why don't you kind of tie it all up for yeah. us and then we're gonna go on and, and, and get out of here. Yeah, absolutely. So, so now, especially with our performance bonus coming in March, um, mm -hmm. um, but ironically, Mr. Grant is taking his consultations in March. Um, the co new coded daily pay that we get, that we get right now, my income, for example, has a four-figure and soon-to-be five-figure per month increase with just that one bonus. Just the coded bonus will bring me an extra four figures and five figures per month. Now, people say, well, Brian, that's you, your, your regional five-star XYZ. No, this is what I'm saying to you guys. If you look at the way the compensation plan is structured, first of all, let's look at the way MWR is structured. When we help you increase your cash flow, that's your existing income. Cash flow means your money stays with you longer. Remember, cash flow is a time measurement, not a dollar measurement. Income is a dollar measurement. Cash flow is a time measurement. So your cash flow is six months. Your cash flow is three years. Your cash flow is 10 years. If not... If you made another dime, if you didn't make another dime, how long would the cash flow you have coming in stay with you? So MWR is going to help you in, with your increase your current cash flow. It's real simple. That's the debt going down, the taxes going down, the expenses going down, your credit score is going up, your cash flow is up, and your assets are up. That's cash flow. Then we create cash flow by showing people how to increase their cash flow. That's our new coded bonus daily. Guys, when I look in my back office, I'm giving you a helicopter perspective. I see 10s, 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Every day that someone joins your organization, once you get to star level three, which is basically 36 people in your organization, star level three is the key to the coded bonus that gives you the income to pay for these this asset protection. Look, mm. you know, Rod is very, very humble, but I, I'll tell it to you guys straight. When you get to a point where the taxes you got, think about what he said, 70000 80000 If you had an extra 20, 15, 18, 22000 that was not going out in taxes, because you know, if you make 70, you know you're getting taxed 18 to 26000 right? What if that was in your pocket every year, Roger, times three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine? 10 years you need to work this business to the point where you got to get this trust fund yes sir yeah one thing there brian is not just what you're keeping but what you can do with that money there you go putting it in the private reserve putting it in the, in the diversified cash flow account putting it in the managed fund that's right how much interest can you earn in the next 20 years and would not give it away if you weren't giving it away that's right yeah, yeah so it's, the, it's the lost opportunity cost that the trust fund, whatever you do, please don't look at twenty five hundred or we don't we don't have to sell you guys. You either can get it or you're not. But twenty five hundred or twelve five or whatever, how much money would you have if you were investing the money that you were losing because you didn't have it? Okay, that's where this comp plan kicks in. Thirty six people is roughly three star. And when you look in your back office every day and see these coded bonuses coming on a daily basis. It will change your perspective on this compensation plan. And then the third thing that we do is what? Passive income. And this is what Mr. Grant was talking about. When you're saving money on taxes and you put it into our investments and now the passive income comes in, you become a couple of things. One, you're bulletproof. Mm. And I love the word that he used earlier um, or in the presentation you'll see. You're, it's 100% transparency. So it's not like you're hiding anything. Everything's right. transparent. It's just that the way you're set up, it's not taxable by certain means, you know? And, and you become audit proof and you become um, protected from lawsuits. So bulletproof, audit proof. I like any kind of proof 
that keeps me that keeps the money in my household a lot longer. I'm with all the proofs, Mr. Grant, and I'm, I'm here to tell you, man. I'm, I'm excited about it. And I thank you for helping me come up with my names and uh, the ease of the paperwork was really simple. The hardest part was what I should call it. Hey, hey what, what did you say about group, Brian? What did you say about group? Oh yeah, yeah. I said, I said, Mr. Grant. Uh, I notice every wealthy person I know. They use the word group okay, in, the, in their name, right? Like, I don't know. You ever notice that? What do people have yeah. the such and such group? Group, right. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, the main group didn't ring right with me. You know, I, I, I feel like I'm kind of fly. So I was trying to come up with something cool. So I had to put the word group in my trust just because <laughs> I want to do a wealthy people. Too. <laughs> so, hey, Absolutely. I love it, man. Don't let the name, don't let the name mess with you guys. Get your paperwork filled out when he's ready get the consultations in it's going to be the easiest thing you've ever done and his firm will take good care of you right and it will be the best thing you've ever done this 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 is truly game changing for everyone in, in mwr so anybody you bring into this environment obviously i saw all the chats everybody going crazy how phenomenal everything is just imagine the impact you can have on not only your family, but then the people around you and having them have impact, who have impact, is that ripple effect that changes everything. Mm -hmm.